Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon. I'm the moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have what hopes to be a very interesting conversation today focused on uh, the topic of our latest ebook, which is Next Generation Security. Um, hopefully the conversation will uh, be enlightening and informative to you all. Uh, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. Today's uh, webinar is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of it, you will be able to access it on demand. We will have a, an email going out after the webinar that will include a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during the presentation you have a question, don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we will take about 15 or 10 minutes before the end of the presentation and go through those questions. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Next Generation Security, a panel discussion. Let me get to that slide. And our speakers today, we have actually two out of the three faces listed here. Our panelists today are Eric Krohn, who is Security Awareness Advocate as at Know Before, and Zane Lackey, who is the CSO at Signal Sciences. Unfortunately, Tim Buntell was unable to join us today, but welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Excellent, excellent. Well, as I said before, I'm Charlene O'Hanlon. I'm the moderator for the event and I'll uh, be driving the conversation, hopefully. And uh, I think we're going to have a really, really good uh, conversation. So, as I said before, today's webinar is actually based on our latest ebook, Next Generation Cybersecurity. And that is uh, an ebook that is now available on securityboulevard.com. And then everybody who registered for today's webinar will act, will also be receiving a link to access the, the webinar, or sorry, uh, access the ebook <laughs> from today's webinar. So, um, so take a look for that. <clears throat> so, um, when we're talking about security, as cybersecurity, um, it almost seems like the 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 phrase next generation is kind of an oxymoron because you know the I think the biggest uh, the biggest piece of advice in security is don't blink because everything is changing so fast. And um, the, the technologies that are cutting edge today are going to be uh, pretty much just uh, ubiquitous tomorrow. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of odd doing a, uh, doing a webinar and an ebook on next generation security when a lot of the technologies that we actually talk about in the ebook are technologies that we already know about and have actually been around for a while, but they really just haven't um, kind of hit the mainstream yet. So um, we've got we've got some really really um, fascinating technologies that are available, and hopefully, I, I think this year we'll be hearing a whole lot more about some of the the security technologies that we're talking about during today's webinar. I can tell you from uh, just anecdotal experience the a lot of the articles that we're posting on Security Boulevard these days have a lot to do with these quote unquote next generation cybersecurity technologies. So I know that there's movement happening in the industry. I know that people are talking about these technologies and uh, it's just a matter of time before they are adopted and become more mainstream technologies. So the state of cybersecurity tools today, um, you know, we've got you know, we've got a lot of uh, just different tools out there that address different issues, and it's creating kind of this piecemeal kind of hodgepodge uh, security, blended security offering that sometimes isn't the most elegant of solutions and often really don't address uh, some of the, the most pressing needs for uh, companies today. And, and, you know, as a result, I think companies are spending a lot of extra time just managing these different security uh, technologies and um, balancing a lot of balls. Um, and so, you know, there are a, a number of security technologies that are coming down the pike that hopefully will help kind of streamline those operations and help security companies, um, you know, 
help help companies in general with their security efforts. And uh, you know, before we actually get started on talking about some of those technology technologies, I'd love to get our panelists just kind of high level view of where they see the state of um, cybersecurity today, and um, what they're hearing from some of possibly from their some of their customers, what they're hearing out in the field about the state of cybersecurity and what are some of the most pressing kind of hot button issues for, for the customers today. So Eric, why don't we start with you? Why don't, um, can you talk a little bit about what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what are some of the, um, you know, the, the, the big, big hot button issues that your customers are dealing with? Yeah, you know, I, I think what I hear a lot uh, from people is having to deal with this, uh, the, the huge amount of data that's running around now that we're having to keep control of, that we're having to keep track of, um, you know, that's a real challenge for people. And and generally speaking, I, I have yet to meet anyone that says, you know, I'm fully staffed. I don't need any more people to do any of this work. Um, I can handle all of the tools they keep throwing in here. Um everything's good. You know, it's kind of like, uh, this is fine. And you got the fire in the background, the whole dog meme there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's kind of the thing that, that I hear a lot is, is the struggles are with, you know, we have all of these tools, we have a lot of data going on. Um, but we really have a hard time keeping track of it all. You know, it, it's great to have next gen this and next gen that, um, the problem is every time you roll out a next gen something, uh, odds are you've now given yourself another pane of glass to try to look at, to try to keep track of, to try to uh, to learn, manage, and you know, let's let's face it, whenever we roll something out, uh, as far as security tools go, we're not an expert in the beginning. We have to spend time in in it to really understand things, to tune it, to really, you know, get an idea of what it's saying. And so, unfortunately. We, we've fallen into this thing where we keep throwing technology and keep throwing technology at things, um, and it's just overwhelming the poor people that are trying to uh, keep track of it all and keep track of um, of all the data that it's generating, uh, and it, it makes a lot of noise. I agree. I agree. So, Zane, um, how about you? What are you hearing from, uh, from the industry, from your uh, customers, uh, as far as what they're, uh, what they're seeing? And... Uh, what, you know, where where their big needs are. Yeah, there's there's something that you said that I thought was spot on, which is that uh, you know the whole kind of next generation thing seems like a misnomer because it seems to be happening every year or two. You see a whole bunch of booths at RSA or Black Hat claiming to be next gen of something in some particular area. I've I've been in this industry about 20 years now, and which I think puts me on my eighth or ninth uh, next generation wave uh, <laughs> at this point. Um, I can tell you, as most of my background has been as a CISO, uh, and you know, it, a week doesn't go by, or more likely, an hour doesn't go by that you don't get an email from some vendor uh, talking about how their next generation something or another. Um, so it's absolutely. I think that term is one that gets continuously used. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, I think. I think there's like two really big forces at work in the security industry today. And I say this both from what I see with customers today and my own background in being a CISO is that uh, the organization, the enterprise is moving orders of magnitude faster than it used to. Uh, the whole shift to DevOps and cloud are really just part of or digital uh, transformation, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. All of this is really around transforming the way that we create and deliver software. And so the orders of magnitude faster that we're moving need to fundamentally change the way that we think about defense there and security really, if I'm gonna condense it down into one very cliche sounding soundbite, uh, it really becomes security has to fundamentally shift from acting as a gatekeeper to really becoming an enabler for the business. Uh, and then number two is that the, the source of risk has really shifted. Um, you know, I think for a lot of us that started it was security going back 15, 20 years ago, risk was always at the infrastructure layer and the network layer. In the past 10 years, it's really shifted out to the endpoint and it's gone up to the application. And that really changes the way that we need to think about our security programs. It really changes the way that we think about tooling and techniques and, and just defense in general. Uh, and it's really a generational shift that's happening right now. And those things are always big and messy and uh, there's a lot to learn. So there's two things that that kind of pop to mind when you when you 
say that. And one is, you know, with the with with the um, with everything shifting out to the applications or the endpoints, um, you know, obviously we are be fastly quickly becoming a mobile society, and we're we're on our mobile devices to these days much more than we are on our computers. And I have to wonder if if that is um, a consideration that is you know, that, that that companies are um, thinking about when they are evaluating their cybersecurity strategies, especially as it comes to um, the, you know the mobile workplace. And then also, um, if there is any uh, indication that that is impacting the way um, employees themselves are approaching security or in, and their security awareness. Um, do you do you have any thoughts on that, Zane? And then and then Eric, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it, also. Yeah, certainly. I I can address the first part more, and I think Eric, you're going to be really well suited for the the second part about awareness. <laughs> um, so to the first part, you know, is that changing our security programs? A absolutely, right. The it, it's really. I think summing it up on that side, we always used to think of security as, you know, kind of the the perimeter, which if we're being honest with ourselves, was always a lie to begin with, but it it felt really good uh, for a number of years. Uh, and we've good. really <laughs> gotten past that and said, look, you know, as the as the workforce and the enterprise becomes increasingly mobile, as the way it interacts with the resources and the data that we're trying to protect, uh, and it, it really changes the way that we interact with that, the way that we need to defend it uh, really changes as well, right? And it used to be very much the concept of DMZs and firewalls and IDSs and IPSs. And then you look at how a modern employee or customer customer interacts with data, and it's probably via a, a mobile app on their device that's talking to a web service backend, where 10 years ago, the only thing at the web layer was the marketing site that maybe you'd put in your, you know, your phone number to get a call from a salesperson about or something like that. And now it's the primary way that you interact with your customer as an enterprise. And so that source of risk has shifted completely. And so the way that we need to think about defense there needs to catch up as well. So Eric, as far as uh, employee uh, awareness with for security and and whether that's changed in light of this uh, kind of shift to a more mobile centric uh, workplace, um, what are your thoughts? What do you what do you see? Yeah, the the thing about mobile devices, and and I'll tell you, I was uh, I was a security manager for the second regional cyber center, Western Hemisphere, the the Army's uh, uh, organization that took care of the Active Directory and all that for North America. And I'll say that um, I was exceptionally lucky in my career that uh, we were not allowed to have cell phones in <laughs> in our classified facility. It made it fantastic, so I didn't have to deal with a lot of the uh, the issues. Of course, now that I'm out of that realm, um, it's a little bit different story. Um, I think that, you know, one of the issues we have as far as the user side goes with cell phones is um, it, it's everything is mixed these days, right? Um, there was a time back in the day where you could almost get somebody to carry two cell phones. I've done that before, a work phone and a, and a, um, a personal phone, although that just doesn't make sense anymore, right? Um, and so we're mixing these environments more than we ever did in the past. And we're doing more than just email on these mobile devices too, right? People are using iPads um, to modify documents to deal with things like that. Now, on the other side, now obviously we at, at Know Before here, we live in this phishing space quite a bit. So we see the attacks that happen on the end users. Um, and the mobile devices still make it much, much more difficult to be able to identify these attacks. And then you couple that with the folk with the fact that people are so, um, I guess, comfortable with these devices. Um, they're very used to using them. It's not like you sit down on a on a you know in front of your computer and do stuff. Um, they're in the pocket. They're out of the pocket. Quick glance back in the pocket. That sort of thing. Very comfortable doing that. So the attackers um, are actually doing pretty well as far as getting people to. Uh, um, to fall for things on their phones. It's much harder to spot. Um, and, and that's kind of an unfortunate thing. Fortunately, most of the malware out there, a lot of the malware these days, doesn't target mobile devices as much. Um, however, you know, we've seen attacks where they just trick people into accepting that laundry list of um, permissions and give it all kinds of rights to do things. 
Um, and so those sorts of attacks keep evolving like that, where it's not even malware as much as it is getting that person to allow the app to do it. Uh, it's a very interesting time and place we're living in with these devices. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And and um, just as an aside, today's National Privacy Day. So um, obviously the uh, the the the, the uh, issue of data privacy is is looming large in our industry as well. So um, what do you guys think about um, you know the fact that we are having still having these major issues with data privacy? And um, we, we still, it, it just seems like we can't, as a society, seem to wrap our brains around the fact that our, you know, our data is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like manna from heaven for hackers. So, you know, I, what do we do about that? I mean, I, I'm at a loss, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> yeah, that seems, to, that seems to be something that, you know, we're, we're still trying to get people to understand that their data is private, right? And, and the thing is, if you go out there and you're all privacy advocate, privacy advocate people look at you like you've, you've grown an extra head, right? Uh, in, this, in this field, we kind of understand it. But here's an example, like uh, my HOA, for example. Um, my HOA is going through a shift right now between um, uh, management companies. And I asked our HOA president, I said, so what's their data retention and destruction policy? And he looked at me like, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then he said, oh, well, there's absolutely no digital data that they have. And I was like, well, here's an email where they asked me to send in a picture of the license plate on my car so I can get a parking pass. So yes, they do. They have that. They have my name and my email address all together in this. And he was like, well, I, I don't know that it's a big deal. And of course, this is from the guy that actually moved our paper records from the one management company. He's now storing 10 years of HOA records for 910 homes in his personal garage, right? Mm -hmm. They just, they don't understand that this data can be used against us, right? And, and it may seem small here and there, but when you start aggregating this sort of stuff, um, that is fantastic information for people to use uh, to, to leverage these attacks. It's just the mindset we can't seem to get around that this is important. Right, right. Zane, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think really kind of taking the, the macro view on this is that, look, this is this is early, right? This is early in this industry. This is early for something that truly changes society on this scale. Um, and it, it always tends to kind of follow a familiar pattern pattern there, which is like the early days are going to be the wild west kind of as we've seen. And then you're probably going to see kind of uh, a regulatory uh, overreaction there in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some for any CISOs on the line, uh, you know, <laughs> things like GDPR might certainly feel like that already in some ways or, or something like that. Um, and then I think then we kind of figure out what is the right uh, middle point there. Uh, I don't have. I, I don't think any of that is going to happen quickly. I think these are things that you know are fundamentally changing society, and that's not going to that's not going to fit with everyone suddenly becoming privacy conscious or privacy aware or being or even having the means to doing something about that. Uh, and at the same time, I don't think an individual country's regulatory framework or individual law is going to fix things overnight either. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the reality is we've got many years ahead of us of trying to figure out as a society, what is the happy medium there? Yeah, the interesting part of this, I, I think, is that um, as we're going through this wild, wild west phase and, uh, and all of that, this is something that is going to remain out there, though, um, in, in perpetuity, basically. I mean, this data that, that we're kind of lax with right now, 20 years from now, we may end up with a, a better mindset around that. However, the data that's going out there right now is already out there. And I, I, I tell people sometimes like, um, you know, what I'm worried about these days is actually less about my information. I'm, I mean, I've been in, I've been a part of the VA breach, the OPM breach, um, Equifax, you name it, right? And so pretty much everything but my shoe size is available <laughs> to somebody at this point, right? And, and I think about it that way. I'm like, okay, well, that stinks. But what about my kids, yeah. you know? What about their data? What about their information? Shouldn't we be trying to not put them in the situation 
that we're in now because they're going to be fighting this for much longer. And we even, you know, we see where kids' identities are being stolen and used for, you know, uh, getting credit cards and things like that already. What about these kids moving forward? You know, that that's where my concern really is. Uh, totally less about agree. The I, yeah, I completely agree. And I think the the ones that are really scary to me, just to kind of put a put a point on that, is the ones that um, the ones that you can't undo and that have generational effects, right? I think everyone in data breaches, the mainstream tends to focus on things like payment instruments, like credit cards and things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. if I had to pick something to get exposed in a data breach, a credit card is the first thing I would pick. That's amazing. <laughs> yep. You can cycle it, you can you know, change out and get a new one. Uh, it's the 23 and me's. Uh, that are really scary, right? How do you change your DNA? How do you change your biometrics? How do you change things like that? You know, OPM, right? And all the the data out of that. It's it's things that you can't change that I think are really where the challenge is going to be. That once the cat's out of the bag on those, there's there's nothing to do there. Uh, and that's that's the bit that's scary for me. Um, but also, I don't I don't have any any real answers there beyond the vague. Uh, vague ones of I think we will figure it out as a society over time, but I think it's going to hit the first few generations of us going through this uh, in a way that's uh, not great, we'll say. Well, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, we're, we're moving into this world where biometrics is becoming an identification thing very often, right? But do we ever think about where those biometrics go? And, you know, like I said, I was part of the OPM breach. I had a TSSCI clearance. I mean, yeah. you know, it, everything out there is is out there for me. But Every time somebody goes into, you know, I look at this when I go to the theme parks here in Orlando and I have to give them a fingerprint. Uh, and, you know, I'm not I'm not the paranoid to the to the point that I'm screaming about it. Like I've actually seen some people do. But mm -hmm. if I give them that and they're, they're careless with it and that goes out somewhere. Well, how do you change that? You can't change your biometrics. So we really do have to be more conscious about where we're giving that stuff up, you know, uh, and, and who's got control of it, because. Once it's out there, you really can't do anything about that. Right, right. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about protecting our, protecting the data, protecting our personal information. Um, and obviously, it's it's up to us to, to make sure that we don't uh, make it easier for folks to take that information and and, and use it against us in, in, in the future. So, um, and hopefully this next generation of cybersecurity tools will help us do that, do a much better job of that. Um, but, you know, there's two other things that I wanted to kind of go over real quick before we kind of move on to what those, uh, some of those next generation cybersecurity tools. One is this um, skills gap that we keep hearing about with cybersecurity and, and you know, I bring it up because a lot of these tech technologies, especially when we're talking about automation uh, and AI and machine learning, um, those are, you know, those are designed ostensibly to help us kind of close that skills gap. But I wonder um, if if that is, uh, if the skills gap is as much an issue as uh, folks make it out to be, is it a question of education kind of catching up with the technology? Or, I mean, are we really experiencing this skills gap and what can be done about it short of just automating everything? Yeah, I can, I can take a stab at that one first. I, I can tell you from multiple CISO roles uh, living through that. I think the the skills gap and skill shortage is absolutely real. You ask anyone mm -hmm. who's hiring or building a team in security, and we all have open headcount. There's there's not enough people out there, mm -hmm. and so there's that pressure. At the same time, the other pressure that's happening is the business is actually moving faster and faster than it ever has. And that's increasing exponentially instead of linearly. So we're feeling pressure from things are moving faster and we're feeling pressure from we're not even able to hire to keep up with that, let alone mm -hmm. get ahead of it. And so how that then shakes out for those of us running security teams is we need to find ways that actually scale uh, for the challenges that we have. Now, mm -hmm. some of that is going to be technology, and that's where I think uh, you know, the, the latest buzzwords of AI and ML and all these sort of things <laughs> come in. To me, I bucket them all into kind of one bucket, which is automation. Uh, and can the tools really automate something that I would need you know, three FTEs to babysit a tool in the past? Can it automate enough where now I don't need any FTEs to work on that? At the next, the kind of next bucket for me is um, 
really around where else can I hire from to train up. So some of the best hires I've ever made onto my security teams were actually uh, software developers and operations folks, like infrastructure operations. Uh, because look, I can teach them security, but I can't teach them the fundamentals of software engineering or infrastructure engineering. So being able to scale that way and, and hire, both hire from other sources onto your teams, but then also do the training back into those development teams and DevOps teams and and really identify champions and potential business partners inside there to train up. That's the other piece. So technology adapting, people adapting. And then the final piece, and this is kind of the larger one to me uh, that ties it all together is really what's kind of the red line for me between legacy security tooling and modern security tooling. And legacy security tooling, of which I mean most of the security tooling that's been built uh, and brought to market for the last 20 years was really designed to be used only by siloed security experts. And what defines modern security tooling to me is tooling that can be directly used by the development teams and the DevOps teams, because the only way we actually scale is if we can make the rest of the business security self-sufficient. So rather than tacking security on at the end, or even as a, as a separate technology altogether, actually incorporating it into the software development process? That's exactly it. The, the parallel that I, I love there, I think the, the short example there is really from, it, it's very similar to um, App Dynamics, New Relic, Datadog, for any folks familiar with those sort of performance monitoring tools. And they took, it's the exact same pattern that security is going through right now. They took something that used to be a siloed, highly specialized group, uh, like performance engineers, uh, which really only the kind of the best tech companies could even afford in the first place. Um, and it brought that capability directly to the development teams and the DevOps teams, where any team using any of those tools could really understand the performance of the services that they were writing and deploying. And now they could self-serve that sort of capability. Security is just starting to learn that same lesson, that this is really the shift that we need to go through. Okay, great. Um, uh, Eric, do you have any comments on that? Any thoughts on the skills gap? And Yeah, the skills gap is definitely uh, an interesting thing. I, I was the director of member relations and services at ISC Squared for a couple of years. That's um, one of the studies that's largely used in the skills gap discussion. Um, so, you know, I've definitely seen that. I think that I think that we we have a couple of issues here, though, and I think it's a little bit deeper than just um, a skills gap necessarily. Um, for one thing, if you've read the recruiter's requirements for some of these job, you know, openings, um, I don't think they really know what they're asking for. I think that's part of the problem that we have out there, right? Um, you know, you need an entry level analyst with uh, 27 years experience, 10 years. <laughs> you know, server 19 and uh, <laughs> three years on something that hasn't come out yet. I mean, exactly. the, the written, <laughs> yeah. it, it's horrible, you know, and it really is. And everybody's got to be a CISSP. Um, and you know what I mean? And so I think, I think we shoot ourselves in the foot sometimes by putting some of these bars pretty high. Now, I have to agree with Zane. Some of the actually best people that I've ever had work for me have been people that were not necessarily a, a security person I brought into the security realm, but they had a passion for security. Their mindset was that of being secure and they were motivated and understood like IT part, right? Instead of having to go outside and getting someone out of school, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but these people inside, they had that, um, I don't even know how to describe it, that drive and that mentality that goes along with the security mentality, right? Um, giving some of those people a chance instead of having to go outside all the time is something that we cannot forget to do. Look around your staff, look around your people, see who is your advocate already or seems to get it and see if this is something they're interested in doing. Because you're right, we can teach them some of the security stuff. What we can't teach people really is the mindset be behind it and, and the passion for being secure. So we, we do have to look at it from that standpoint as well. Um, but we also have to understand what it is we're actually looking for. And, you know, sometimes sometimes a junior analyst can be somebody without a whole lot of, you know, security experience instead of always trying to go for these high level things. Now, when Zane's talking about tools, that's something that uh, I am huge on because some of these tools are made, like he said, you know, for security professionals in a silo. And first of all, mm -hmm. some of us security people, we got to ditch our attitudes 
about how this is all elite and you know so on and so forth. No, we, we got to ditch some of that. We have value. Don't worry about that. Make these tools so that normal people can use them. And I'll use kind of like what we do here as an example here. We do security awareness training, right? And a lot of times that's been put on um, the IT or security department just because it's dealing with computery stuff um, and, and it doesn't do very well. What One of the focuses we have and one of the reasons we're so popular is we've made it very easy to do, so easy that a lot of HR departments are actually running their security training for end users. Um, that's the kind of thing that takes the load off the security people that you already have in place and frees up some of those FTEs to actually be doing some of those things that, that they need the skills to do. That's a big difference right there. You don't want to be weighing down your skilled people on, on, on the silly stuff, you know? So I do think we have an issue there. I think it's getting a little bit better, mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to continue to look around a little bit more and, and look within our own organizations for the people with the right mindset. Um, rather than just always expecting to go outside. Okay. All right. Great. Um, gosh, we're just flying through the hour here, so I want to I want to go ahead and move up. <clears throat> excuse me. Move ahead with the, uh, you know, the the, the final um, kind of uh, catalyst, if you will, for uh, for the the security next generation security, and and that is um, the advent of big data and the the resulting data deluge that a lot of companies are experiencing now. Um, and you know, I honestly feel like there's so much data coming in that that organizations are actually missing opportunities for better, faster, deeper security because they actually can't spot the opportunities there. They can't spot the, uh, the, the potential breaches and, and the, you know, the, the markers, if you will, for, uh, for our, a, a data breach. So, um, guys, what are your what are your thoughts, just kind of in general, on you know this this data deluge and and you know what we can do about it? Do you want to start, Eric? Because I heard I heard you chuckling. So yeah, you know, <laughs> one word one word came to mind when you're talking about that, um, and that is target. You know, yeah, oh look the at these alerts. Data They're yeah. so annoying. You know, <laughs> it, it's yeah. it's just a, it being overwhelmed with information. And um, again, as we generate more information and more information from these tools and analytics, and and we look at the behavior stuff, and we're logging this, we're logging that. You know, it's it's not like back in the old days where, you know, your Windows Server had a couple of logs, and that's all you had to worry about on occasion. This stuff's got to be going real time. Um, when you're threat hunting, when you're doing that, you have, you know, minutes to make a decision that's going to impact your organization based on just the amount of data that's coming through, whether or not somebody's in there, whether they're doing something, whether they're escalating privileges. This is all stuff that is happening at the speed of light. Um, very, very difficult for people to keep track of and filter out the noise. Um, and, and I think that's that's part of the big problem. We create so much noise around this good data that, that getting through that, I think we're definitely missing opportunities for that. So Zane, in your role as CISO, um, I imagine you are having to deal with this regularly. So um, what are some of the things that kind of come to mind when you think about this data deluge? Yeah, I don't think I know uh, a, a CISO on the planet who says, man, I wish I had more raw data right, right. now. <laughs> <laughs> and no one ever. Um, right? <laughs> yeah, that is not a common sentiment, I would say, to put it mildly. Um, I mean, look, like, uh, I don't think it's anything revolutionary there. I right. think that uh, it's really kind of taking data that we have, taking the, the sources of data that we need and recognizing that that's kind of uh, a piece of the means to get to the ends that we actually want, which is mm -hmm. actionable learning, actionable insights and actionable kind of coverage here. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's not the ends all by itself. Like it, it doesn't matter to me how much raw data a particular security team has if they're not able to take uh, worthwhile actions out of that. And then ultimately, what I really want is to move past that uh, from where you know it's only data feeding into just security analysts who have to then escalate 
uh, kind of the, the traditional legacy uh, security operations path. What I really want is data that's consumable and actions that are consumable enough, or sorry, insights that are consumable enough that my development teams and my DevOps teams can directly make use of them. Because I think it's the only way we scale. I think this question and the, the kind of previous one around headcount really become the same underlying problem for security teams, which is we need to be able to feed actionable insights directly to the development teams and DevOps teams. I mean, that's our, our founding story as a company is Signal Sciences is basically when I was in my past CISO role at Etsy, uh, being one of the, the first ones to go through the shift to DevOps and cloud, we got so fed up with the legacy web app firewalls that we had, the, the Imperva, F5, Akamai, and getting no real visibility out of them and constantly having to tune the things that we built a modern approach there we left Etsy, we turned that into Signal Sciences, and that's uh, what, like, kind of how I use the product itself in-house for ourselves, too, is mm -hmm. being able to feed that uh, insight directly to the development teams and the DevOps teams. Okay. So, I mean, obviously, these two catalysts, the, you know, the skills gap, the data deluge, those are kind of gimmies when we talk about security and, and the need for these next generation technologies. So, um, but, but obviously, they're conversations that are not new, and they're conversations that we continue to have. And I, and I have a feeling we're going to continue to have them for a while. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, hopefully by the time we... Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I don't want to put any time limit on it, but hopefully relatively soon we'll get to a point where we won't be having these conversations anymore <laughs> and um, that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll really seriously be more proactive in our actions and rather than reactive. So, so let's go ahead and move along then and talk about some of the, these quote unquote next generation security tools um, that are, I, I warn you right now, are not really next generation. As I said before, these are technologies that we have been talking Talking about for a while, but but they really do. They they they're maturing now to the point where um, they're they're no longer the stuff of science fiction, so to speak. They are they are technologies that um, will demonstrate real value for companies that um, are willing to to adopt them and to and and to want to derive the, the most value for them. And so, but before I change the slide, I do want to remind the audience that we are taking questions near the end of the presentation. And uh, if you have a question, go ahead and submit it, and we'll get to it hopefully by the end of the presentation. The first one is obviously um, artificial intelligence. Um, you know, just, just as a, a real high level uh, descriptor, you know, it's artificial intelligence mimics human intelligence and performance and you see it there on the screen. So I'm not gonna read it out to you, but um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's, it's a technology that we've been talking about for a long time in a number of different areas of technology. Uh, the implications for security uh, are, are huge. Um, there's also, I think, a lot of folks who are a little sketchy when it comes to artificial intelligence because of the, um, you know, obviously, <laughs> I think Terminator, but, you know, that's just me. Um, I, I, I think there's, you know, some people are kind of, uh, worried about about the way artificial intelligence could be used uh, p perhaps against us uh, uh, and um, yeah the, but but there are certain definite pros to to artificial and artificial intelligence there's also you know certain cons um, but the, there's a ton of really um, good uses for artificial intelligence and security and Zach I'm really interested in finding out, um, where you see AI kind of fitting into the whole security um, conversation. Yeah, I think AI is is good. Where I've mostly seen it adopted with at least some success is around kind of human um, human investigations, right? So kind of your classic security operations team and you know working with a sim where when some type of alert goes off, here are the five, uh, checks that they run immediately afterwards or data sources that they need to pull up or, or anything like that. That's predominantly where I've seen uh, AI as an actual approach uh, be helpful to security teams is to really augment the people that they have so that one person can kind of perform the output of three people historically, that they don't need to do everything manually there. And if, if that sounds like a fuzzy line between 
AI and just kind of some good bash scripting and automation. That's because I think it really is a fuzzy line right now. Mm. Right? I think we are we are a long time away from uh, the days of Skynet and things like that. I think what we're really at is, hey, how can we have some automation that can either predict information that we're going to need next to be able to make a decision uh, or, you know, start to do some of these basic tasks for us so that everyone can be more productive and can scale more effectively there. That's predominantly where I see these sort of technologies making use. Now, don't get me wrong. I think if you walk the floor of RSA in a month, uh, there'd be a million vendors happy to tell you <laughs> doing AI to solve everything out there. Uh, but the reality is I think there are certain areas where it is being a bit effective and other areas where it's really just a marketing gimmick. That's a that's a really good point because you know we've seen the same thing with uh with the cloud and and all these companies all of a sudden being becoming cloud companies and you know going and saying that oh we're you know we're a cloud company when they they really are not so I think we're gonna see I, I call it AI washing where a lot of companies are uh, going to say that they they have implemented AI or, or AI as part of their technology because it's the the buzzword of the day. Um, and but I think I think we'll see uh, as AI advances and matures, we're going to see a lot of those companies just kind of fall through by the wayside um, because it'll be painfully obvious that uh, that they're not really using AI. Um, Eric, what are your thoughts on AI? And and I know you we spoke offline and and you. you claim to be no no expert on the topic which is totally fine but um, being in the field you've got you've got to have some interaction with AI and, and quote unquote AI technologies yeah well I got to say uh, first of all whenever we talk about AI I like to say this especially in a, a situation like this where it's being recorded um, I for one welcome our new digital overlords <laughs> Okay, so that's just on the record right now. It's on the record, and um, it's out yeah. there. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, you know, ultimately, I, I think a lot of it is marketing right now. I, I actually think it's it's a fascinating um, thing to do. We've actually applied it here, and I, I think it's pretty interesting what we've been able to do with it here. Um, we've used it to actually take organizations and predict the behavior of the individuals down to who's going to be your next people to click on some of these phishing attacks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we use that to leverage that to say, all right, these are the people you need to focus on. And it's actually been um, remarkably accurate in being able to do that. And we can group it by like individual or by um, department sort of things. And what that does is it allows those to kind of bubble up and say, all right, these folks look like they're going to be prone to that. Maybe we need to throw, you know, a three to five minute training at them to to take a difference. But I've actually seen that work pretty well. So um, I was surprised by it. Um, I thought it was very interesting. Um, and I'm starting to feel more and more comfortable that we're reaching a point that it's less of a gimmick, less of a marketing term. And it actually is moving into being useful in some cases. Now, we can't expect that it's going to completely um, replace humans, right? And, and and general AI sort of things, um, that's, that's a whole different story. But when we focus it and we do like a narrow AI on a certain problem uh, and we have a lot of data to give it, uh, I think that we actually have reached a point where we can be pretty good at, at some of this stuff for predicting things. Um, again, I think mm -hmm. it's going to be uh, a, a very interesting road forward. I'm, I am watching it, but I think you're right. RSA is going to be AI everything. You know, there is not going to be anything at RSA that doesn't have some sort of tie into AI, much like, again, the cloud was a few years ago. Um, right. We just expect that. It's a matter of, of, of sorting the, the wheat from the chaff, if you will. Exactly. Exactly. I think the other buzzword we're going to be seeing a lot at RSA is machine learning, um, which is not the same as AI. Um, machine learning is actually a subset of AI, but uh, it's you know it it has to do with improving specific tasks by uh, by using algorithms to help improve them. So um, uh, analyzing big data for threat analysis is, is a prime example of that. But um, you know, do you guys maybe see machine learning being uh, maybe uh, more useful in security than AI, or or do you think that there's they're kind of going to be on equal footing? Zach, what do you think? Yeah, well, Zane, I think I'm the, sorry. Uh, no worries. <laughs> uh, 
You know, I think the the important thing for folks there is if you say the the two of them back to back three times in a row, a Series A term sheet just appears in your inbox. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. So that's, that's probably like the most juice, effective right? <laughs> use of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I see, you know, ML where AI, I've seen it with that specific kind of SOC focused, automation focused use case. ML where I typically see it um, both one subset of it, how it's marketed, but also where it's probably used the most successfully is to try to look for outliers inside a given data set. And so that then starts to translate to kind of IDS style approaches, antivirus style approaches, right? You see the the modern um, endpoint protection companies like CrowdStrike, Silence, Carbon Black, uh, some of them more than others tend to talk about AI and, and ML a bunch, um, having built similar systems in house in the past you know, it's really about uh, how can I try to find some sort of unique anomalous event that's happening inside my organization? Because inside the security context, unique and anomalous usually equates with bad. Um, <laughs> the reality, though, facing all of us is that uh, production environments and real enterprise scale deployments are weird. They're messy. Anomalies happen all the time. And this, I think, is the, the big challenge is that especially going back a number of years ago, if a vendor pitched me an ML solution, I would just replace uh, everywhere that said machine learning in their pitch with false positives. And then I would find it to be fairly accurate uh, for the most part <laughs> as, a, as a pitch. I think the reality is the technology is absolutely getting better over time, right? It's kind of early days for the deployments of this type of tech. I think there's a lot of promise there. And I think it's a, it's a tool in the toolbox of a security team trying to scale. Yeah. Okay. All right. Eric, what about you? Um, have you had much interaction with uh, machine learning and, and so where, where do you really kind of see it shining in security? Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of where we focused here um, because we're looking at specific parameters with, uh, with all these end users. Um, you know, we did the deep neural sort of thing, blah, 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 blah. Um, but it, I, I think it's actually, it's really good when you focus it on certain things. And I think this is why the narrow AI is supposed to the, the general broad trying to have a computer be just like a human uh, comes into play, right? Your machine learning is how you get that information uh, to there. And, and I like what, uh, you know, what Zane said there about finding the anomalies, right? Um, so you want to test your stuff, you know, get your machine learning to, to, to look at how things are running for a while and, and then go fire off chaos monkey and see what happens, you know, see what you can spot or can't spot. If you don't know what chaos monkey is, uh, it, it's, it's a pretty cool little, uh, tool that uh, was used by Netflix. Um, but, you know, look for those anomalies like that, see if you can spot them. But um, I think definitely, yeah, you, you have to have a lot of focus on the machine learning thing. We're not at the point that we can just like let it go broad and, and try to, uh, you know, have the machine learn enough to be a human. It, it's not going to happen for a long time. Um, but I do see a lot of uh, very interesting stuff happening in this area um, where they're able to become pretty accurate. Um, when looking for those anomalies like that. So, yeah. Okay. So the last one uh, that, that I wanted to uh, talk about in today's presentation, and just as an aside, um, these are just three of uh, the different next generation technologies that are listed in the ebook. So uh, I encourage uh, everybody who's on today's webinar to take a look at the ebook and, and uh, you can see uh, what are the other next generation technologies are. Um, we just didn't have time to do all of them in this webinar. But the last one is behavior analytics. And again, um, this is an anomaly detection technology. Um, you know, just taking a look at, at uh, I, I guess we are, as humans, we <laughs> we are creatures of habit. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, behavior analytics is one way to kind of catch us in the act if uh, if we start behaving differently. So, um, you know, uh, what do what do you guys think of behavior analytics? And and do you, I personally, I think that of the three that we've discussed, I think behavior analytics is uh, it really has more um, f uh, feet on the street right now, if you will. It's it's ready for prime time more than the other technologies are. But I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about them. Zane, what do you think? Yeah, I think it kind of blends in with uh, some of the use cases I gave for ML, right? It's It, it maps back to 
actions that we all understand have a security impact, right? Of uh, the examples in here, for for example, of you know an individual who normally just transfers a, a standard amount of data and then suddenly sends uh, eight terabytes of data out the door to a, a FTP site in you know, whatever country you want to pick. Uh, mm -hmm. it, those sort of anomalies are very easy to describe. Um, and so you can start to build some systems around kind of known known actions that would be anomalous uh, for a, a given environment. And then you start to try to automate on top of that and say, okay, well, what are, uh, what are things that I wasn't able to predict as an anomalous action that if they happen, I should be warned about. And so mm -hmm. I, you know, I think all of these, they, they lend themselves to automation. They have some real, um, real potential there. And I, I've certainly seen seni plenty of security programs that um, have been able to build some really interesting and effective controls off of that. Um, I think as with any of these technologies, I don't think any of it is at the point where you just point a magic black box at your entire environment and say, tell me every anomaly that ever happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you will, that may happen, but it will give you every anomaly of which 99.999% you know, <laughs> are totally benign. Yeah. Uh, so you kind of have to balance it with, okay, uh, what are the things that are actually important to me and how do I scale up from there? Um, but you know, as, as I said on the previous one, I think it really bears a lot of weight here as well. Is that this is a tool in the toolbox of mm -hmm. thinking about security in a next generation way, which is all about scale and automation. Right, right. Well, you know, you, you as you said, um, security. There, there's there are a lot of anomalies in security, and so um, taking that into consideration, it's you just can't flip the switch and walk away from these technologies. You've got to, you've got to have a human there who's, who's analyzing it all and taking a look and making sure that what the system says is an, is an anomaly and a possible threat, you know, is, is really more a glitch or just something, you know, benign that, that really has no impact on the security at all. Um, but, uh, but I think that automation is, is definitely going to be a, uh, a critical factor in all of these. Um, Eric, before we uh, start running out of time here, what, what are your thoughts on behavior analytics? Um, you know, behavior analytics uh, for me, where it really hits home is endpoint protection. And, and Zane mentioned that too. I, I see this a lot in endpoint protection. I think it, it does a fantastic job in like anti-ransomware and, and those sorts of things, um, you know, crypto jacking, uh, being able to spot those things. Uh, I, I'm one of these folks that I don't, while I don't believe that endpoint protection is dead, I think if you're running a signature only endpoint protection these days, whatever time you're spending managing it is wasted. You might as well not do it. Um, okay. Moving this behavioral analytics into that, you know, looking at, okay, so this person all of a sudden out of the blue started encrypting, you know, 200 files per second or 200 per minute or whatever they can do. Um, that's a weird thing. We're going to stop this and make sure that's what they mean to do. Um, seeing things like that through the endpoint protection piece, uh, to me, is, uh, while not foolproof, a very, very valuable thing to do. Um, and I've seen a number of organizations where this sort of anomalous behavior being flagged and stopped has really saved their bacon, um, you know, dropped their, their losses down to something minimal or gotten to the point that, uh, you know, recovery is much faster because it didn't just get a chance to run for a while in the background. So I really think that, uh, I think you, you're both right. This is where it has legs right now. I think this is where um, it's actually doing some pretty good things out there. Okay. Great, great. Well, as I said before, these are just three of the uh, different technologies that are considered quote unquote next gen and that we've included in our ebook. So I do encourage everybody to take a look at it and uh, read the entire list. Um, but I do also want to point out that with any next generation technology or existing technology, um, they're not panaceas. They are not, you know, the, the, as I said, flip a switch and walk away from, you can't, you can't do that. Um, every technology, I don't care what it is, it, it needs, it still needs humans to be effective. So, um, we keep talking about the skills gap 
And a lot of these technologies are designed specifically to help close that skills gap. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we've got some we've got some serious education uh, that needs to happen. And um, these these technologies are not meant in any way to to replace uh, those people. So um, it's also important to to point out that every single one of these technologies that we discussed today and and all the others can be used for harm as much as they can be for good. So um, that is, um, you know, that's critical in uh, in making the decision on the, the types of technologies that you use and just security awareness in general. Um, you know, one of the things that we um, actually kind of discussed a little bit at the beginning is, is just kind of security awareness around employees and users in general. And, you know, this, this most recent Facebook 10-year challenge is a perfect example of that. And I just wanted to bring that up because, you know, we're talking about behavior analytics. We're talking about machine learning, AI. Um, we, we just fed the machine with, with more information about us that they can use um, now for uh, creating algorithms to, to help to help detect um, people, you know, just from facial recognition uh, in the aging process. So, um, you know, depending on how you feel about that, um, you know, a lot of folks these days are inadvertently um, feeding the machine, as it were, and um, and providing this this data that um, may seem harmless, um, but you you just never know what. Uh, you know what the uh, the hackers and and uh, the security bad guys have in mind for that information, and um, as as I've always advocated, a layered approach to security, I believe, is the best way to go about doing it. There is no one size fits all solution for anything. So um, with that in mind, we have about four four minutes to the top of the hour, which is just enough time, I think, for um, for. Uh, Eric and Zane to kind of provide some closing remarks on wh where they see kind of the, the security space in general, where they think uh, cybersecurity is, is headed and, and uh, how these next generation technologies are really going to fit in and benefit security. So Eric, why don't we start with you and uh, provide us some, some closing remarks? Yeah, you know, I, I think as we move forward, obviously, um, protecting data, all that is going to be more and more uh, difficult and important uh, as more and more data is gathered about us uh, to include metadata, things like that. That all needs to be kept in mind. I love your talk there about the Facebook 10 year challenge. Uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, it, you can't change your biometrics. So if you start feeding the machine, you know, what's going to happen in the future? I, I hate to be tinfoil hat wearing, but it's something that we do need to consider, right? Uh, and frankly, that one made me mad because my wife looks like she didn't age at all. And I look like I aged about 30 <laughs> years. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it is definitely one of those things that um, we have to keep this in mind. And it's going to be more and more challenging. I think it's interesting to watch the tools that we create on the defensive side being matched or, you know, overrun by the tools being done on the offensive side. Um, the attackers, the the you know, the good guys and the bad guys were always playing whack-a-mole. We always have been, quite frankly, but I think the pace has accelerated so much these days. Um, it's kind of mind-boggling, you know, and the uh, the breaches that are happening are sizes that'll just boggle our minds, um, but we can still look at these things and, and pull some uh, some very interesting information out of them. For example, the latest uh, that 773 million password uh, username and password loss deal. If you look at the number of unique passwords in there, um, it's very low compared to the sheer number of things. So that tells me that we have to worry. Uh, we have to work with people still on password reuse. Um, there's a lot of information that flows around out there. At, we're going to have to keep just playing this game over and over again, um, and hopefully, you know, we'll stay ahead more than we get behind. Excellent. Okay. Zane, parting thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't disagree with any of that. And I think, <laughs> seeing as how I've got about a minute left, I'll do the, the very uh, condensed version. Uh, I think for all of us as practitioners uh, on the security side of things, look, we're going through this fundamental change around DevOps, around cloud, around digital transformation. I think it's the, the biggest generational change we've had in security in quite a long time. And I think we have to figure out how to adapt our security programs from this kind of 
siloed gatekeeper to figuring out how to actually enable the business to move as fast as it wants to do that. I think it's a really tough challenge. Um, I just wrote a, a book on that actually coming out of the lessons learned of what I wish I would have been able to tell myself on day one of being a CISO through mm. there. Uh, so uh, happy to, if any folks want to ping me from this, I'm happy to send you a copy of that. Uh, I think the kind of the, the DevOps uh, ebook here as well uh, is great. Also, right, I think all of this sort of material of how do we adapt our security programs to these fundamental changes that are happening, uh, that's the biggest strategic challenge that we're facing. And we change it through you know, people, through technologies, and, and through new techniques there. Um, and yeah, the more we can help each other, the better. Awesome. All right, great. Well, I do want to thank Eric Crone and Zane Lackey for joining me today. What a great conversation, guys. I really enjoyed it. I hope uh, I hope you guys did as well. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Awesome, for having awesome. Us. Well, I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. Sorry we did not get to, to questions, but uh, feel free, uh, if you do have a question, just feel free to follow up with either one with any of us, and we'll be more than happy to uh, hopefully get your question answered. Um, uh, we have run out of time, so uh, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody.